So tonight we do welcome Father Robert Sirico, the pastor of Sacred Heart. Finally, after two and a half years of doing this, we have him on the books, and he's here. And he's going to be speaking tonight on In Conversation with Ladalto C, The Limits of the Church's Magisterium. So if you only know Father as the um, pastor of Sacred Heart or the um, president of the Acton Institute, there's a little bit more that he does with all of his spare time. Uh, he lectures at colleges, universities, business organizations, all throughout the U.S. and abroad. He writes on religious, political, and economics, uh, politics and economics, and social matters. Uh, he's published in a variety of journals, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, the London Financial Times, just to name a few. He's often called upon by members of the broadcast media, including TMZ now. You saw that. That <laughs> made me chuckle just a little bit. Um, but he's provided commentary on uh, stations like CNN, ABC, the BBC, NPR, uh, in 60 Minutes as well. So um, we're going to let you open up with prayer, if you would. So Father Sirico, let's give him a warm welcome. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great and merciful God, we come before you asking your spirit to inspire our minds, make us attentive to the promptings of your will, help us to use our intellectual faculty to probe the truths that you have laid down in the world. We pray that tonight might be an edifying experience for us, an invigorating one, an inspiring one, that as we learn our responsibilities in the midst of your creation, we may faithfully carry them out. We pray this through Christ our Lord. And Amen. 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 Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Mark, um, I would have been here sooner had I been invited. Oh. <laughs> and. Uh, and your delay is the reason it's costing you so much to have me here. <laughs> it's, it's really great to finally be able to give a talk that I don't have to travel miles to go. I just let the dog out in the backyard and put him back in the house and came over. And I thought, oh, I don't have to get on a plane. I don't have to so. Now, let me warn you because um, Oh, uh, there's another thing I want to say, and that is that it's a real joy to be at Authenticum. I am a great admirer of what uh, is going on here, and to be the pastor of the parish that um, hosts this uh, event every month is a joy to my pastoral heart, to my intellect. And uh, even though I haven't been able to, to be at as many of the lectures, that I would have liked to. Uh, I'm very proud to, that they're going on here right under uh, my own nose. I should say to you right at the outset that um, this will not be like my preaching at all. I'm going to read you a paper. It's an academic paper. This is a high level uh, intellectual encounter. And so this is not like my, you know, I, I get up and preach from a matchbook sometimes, you know, I'll have three or four words and having prayed about it, then I just kind of go to town on it. Um, this is a paper that I have delivered uh, in two, uh, on two occasions. One was at the um, uh, University of uh, the Holy um, Cross, the Opus Dei University in Rome, at a conference we had there on La Dauta Si. Um, and then I delivered it at a private conference of International Bishops Forum in Portugal. And uh, when I was asked if I would speak, I thought this would be a, a good, uh, and I think somewhat provocative paper, if you can stay away through the whole thing, um, <laughs> that will incite some discussion. Um, following the promulgation of Pope Francis's encyclical, uh, a rich dialogue Indeed, a debate ensued, and one that the Pope himself called for. Uh, tonight, I hope that we'll have a continuation of that dialogue, that debate, in response to this invitation of the Holy Father. It's important at the outset that I affirm the goals that the Holy Father sets in his encyclical. 
namely, quote, to protect our common home and to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development of the planet. What, what Christian, after all, would want to deny these objectives? The Pope is also correct when he says that there is a, quote, need for forthright and honest debate, close quote. Because hoping and desiring is one thing, while finding practical ways in which to achieve it is another. I trust that tonight's intervention will provide a continuation of that endeavor. Now, prior to examining Laudato Si itself, I propose that we remind ourselves about the broader principles related to the nature of Catholic theology itself. Then our study of Laudato Si will be enriched by a clear grasp of what it means to speak authoritatively from the viewpoint of Roman Catholic ecclesiology. Thus I propose the following questions. What are the boundaries of church teaching? What is the authority of such teaching? Are there differences in the meaning and levels of such teaching? What is the nature specifically of Catholic social teaching? So to explore these questions is to explore the concept of the magisterium as such, the teaching office of the church as such. Although often misunderstood and misconstrued both by those inside and outside the church, while the church's teaching authority claims that its magisterium might be called, be said to have a privileged insight into matters of faith and morals, the church intentionally limits her specific competency to these areas, faith and morals. We know that the whole of the magisterium is comprised of the bishops and derivatively from them, bishops' conferences, who teach in union with the Pope when reflecting on faith, morals, and the authentic interpretation of scriptures and the tradition of the church. This privileged status is predicated on the enduring gift of the Holy Spirit given by the Lord to the apostles, which ensures that the message of Christ entrusted to the church is free of doctrinal error, or as it said, indefectible. As I've already noted, this magisterial authority has always admitted its own limitations and boundaries. The popes and bishops cannot infallibly predict the weather, for example or call the winning numbers of a lottery, as much as some of us might want that to be possible from time to time. It's also the case that the boundaries may be obscure or may touch up against certain matters outside of the, church, of the magisterium's immediate mission. This, of course, makes the task of properly interpreting these documents a more challenging and indeed exciting endeavor. Yet it does not weaken the church's claim to competently and authoritatively proclaim the truth of morals and faith. The church simply does not claim to speak with the same authority on matters of economics and science as it is stated in the Compendium of Social Doctrine of the Church, number 68, quote, Christ did not bequeath to the church a mission in the political, economic, or social order. The purpose he assigned to her was a religious one. This means that the church does not intervene in technical questions with her social doctrine, nor does she propose or establish systems or models of social organization. This is not part of the mission entrusted to her by Christ." Close quote. These are, of course, distinctions, not separations. The two realms come close to one another at times because some means and ends can interpenetrate one another. Yet to simply collapse, say, theology into science is unnecessary, unhelpful, and even at times perilous. As Gaudi Metzpez says, quote, if by the autonomy of earthly affairs we mean that created things and societies themselves enjoy their own laws and values which must be gradually deciphered, put to use, and regulated by men, then it is entirely right to demand that authority. Close quote, number 36. The models under which the church has proposed her teaching are various. One, ex one finds extraordinary and ordinary teaching of the popes by way of encyclicals, apostolic 
letters. We're going to have one released tomorrow morning, by the way, stay tuned. Uh, allocutions and homilies. Various documents of Vatican dicastery, secretariats and commissions, the teachings of bishops, even within their own diocese or either within their own diocese or in the context of their national uh, conferences, as well as the teaching of pastors to their parishioners and of catechists to catechumen. All of these may be seen as participating at various degrees and levels in the church's teaching, mission, and authority. Our discussion relates, when we talk about Laudato Si, to an encyclical, which thereby enjoys a relatively privileged position within the hierarchy of official Catholic teaching. Encyclicals are authoritative teaching documents that command due respect and consideration from the faithful. At the same time, three considerations should be borne in mind. First, as an encyclical, Adapto C makes no general claim to infallibility as such. And in fact, it says, quote, on many concrete questions, the church has no reason to offer a definitive opinion. She knows that honest debate must be encouraged among experts while respecting divergent points of view, close quote, number 61. Second, the subject matter of Laudato Si, climate science, economics, and history, do not fall into the areas of the church's expertise except to the extent to which it addresses the normative dimensions and implications of these disciplines. Third, Laudato Si must be read attentively to determine where Pope Francis is speaking from the core of Catholic doctrine and where he is applying some prudent point of practical application of that core to the day-to-day -day world. With this understanding, we may now turn ourself, ourselves to the encyclical itself. Laudato Si proceeds along two lines of thought in order to engage the challenge that it places before us, namely, uh, the first is a theological line of reflection, which gets at the understanding of the human relationship to the created order and man's responsibility toward the created order. And as an aside, I should mention that I was puzzled that the encyclical did not begin with the insights of Revelation on this subject and instead plunges immediately into making a series of empirical claims. Theology, rather than sociology or economics, is surely the starting place for Catholic reflection on matters temporal. The second line of thought relates to the practical dimension of how to attain the fulfillment of the theological responsibility. Those latter sections of Laudato see the touch on the understanding that nature itself is revelatory of God's design, underscore that here in creation is a connection to its creator and his intentionality. The same can be said for humanity itself. Man is, after all, created in the Imago Dei. Therefore, he is not only a part of creation, as the encyclical makes clear, but is its very steward, that is to say, the way by which the created world is to be cared for and tended to. As the Holy Father has emphasized not only in Laudato Si, but also in the whole of his pontificate thus far, the tending and care must be especially attentive to the poor and the most vulnerable amongst us. For they too are creations of God. They too bear the Imago Dei. They too reveal God to us. They are the ones through whom we encounter Jesus in, as it has been said, distressing disguises. They are the very least ones and through whom we minister to Christ himself. There are, of course, many ways to minister to the poor by the proclamation of the good news and bonding with them in fraternal embrace and fellowship and solidarity and tending to their physical needs, particularly in dire circumstances. To enable people to be less poor and less vulnerable, more in charge of the direction of their own lives, and to help them to flourish and prosper, would, I believe, also be a fulfillment of this mandate. The connection that Laudato Si makes between care for the environment and the needs of the poor in particular, 
and the economy more generally is critical to get right. If we fail at this connection, we fail in realizing both objectives. As I've noted already, it is important to underscore the distinction between the theological dimension of Laudato Si and its empirical, scientific, and economic claims, which I would also like to probe more deeply here. A particularly fruitful part of the dialogue for which Laudato Si calls, it seems to me, lies somewhere between its major title, Praised Be God, Laudato Si, and its subtitle, Our Care for Our Common Home. Here is what we know. The riches of the earth which God created do not simply place themselves at our disposal automatically. If they did, there would be no such thing as scarcity or even a need for rationing or conservation and thus no need for the science of economics, which enables us to allocate scarce resources, reduce waste and costs and other externalities. There would, in fact, be no need for work itself which is a calling entrusted to the human family even prior to the fall. The reality of scarcity, which gives rise to the discipline of economics itself, also tells us that people simply cannot fulfill all of their needs. From a theological perspective, the fact that man has eternity inscribed on his very nature, as Ecclesiastes says, is a reminder that beings built for eternity, that is designed by and for God himself, can never be completely fulfilled by the material world. And that when humans settle for the trinkets and baubles of this life, as though they were the goal of life, they not only commit the sin of idolatry, but they also promote a certain disorder in their own souls, in the world, and in the environment. But the rejection of substitutes for God, call it idolatry or consumerism, is not the same as rejecting the fundamental goodness of the material world. The only state of being where this proper ordering exists is in that encounter of which Dante so movingly speaks at the conclusion of the La Divina Commedia as l'amore che muove soli all'altre stelle the love that moves the uh, sun and all of the stars. But in this valley of tears, we are unfortunately stuck with the need for such an order. It is precisely scarcity that gives rise to the need to economize. In some instances, this may be another way to describe conservation. To know how to conserve a thing involves knowing, at some level, the real costs associated with it. Frugality is not cheap, parsimonious, or ungenerous. Frugality is based on the knowledge of the cost of things and their proper use, which in turn is related to the scarcity of the thing. In paragraph 110 of Laudato Si, the Holy Father makes an important observation on what he calls the, quote, fragmentation of knowledge, close quote, quote, that he says, quote, proves helpful for concrete applications, close quote. Put another way, no one can know everything. Hence, we have a certain degree of specialization and in inevitably a division of labor. Among other things, this helps us to see how the market can be applied to the needs of the environment. In the setting of environmental problems, the division of labor allows people with different talents and abilities to apply them to issues of how we conserve and use resources in unique and productive ways to meet human needs and to preserve creation. Pope Francis cautions that this fragmentation can lead as well to what he calls a loss of appreciation for the whole, for the relationships between things, and for the broader horizon, close quote. This is certainly true. Many specialists today know a great deal about one or two subjects and then virtually nothing about anything else. 
there is then a requirement for some coordination of information among various sectors so as not to lose sight of the whole. One way that environmental degradation and even poverty might be described would be to say that it is evidence of a failure to know and to coordinate the value of things. After all, people do not generally degrade or discard what they see as having value. But they first need to know it. If we're going to effectively respond to the to what the Holy Father calls the technocratic paradigm, we do indeed need interdisciplinary cooperation as well as actual knowledge of the relative availability of goods and resources, that is, the real scarcity and abundance of things. This, of course, is precisely why centralizing knowledge and planning is inadequate to yield the broad range of knowledge required to prevent degradation of the economy and of the environment. People, workers, producers, and consumers alike must be able to see clearly the connection between material goods and economic value. The division of labor, or any kind of hyper-specialization, can become hegemonic and thus blind to the facts or truths outside its own competency. It is the classic case that to a hammer everything looks like a nail. And from a philosophical and theological perspective, a certain humility is required among various disciplines in respect for their relative autonomy. This insight becomes critical in the challenge of caring for our common home. Because when one discipline sees itself as the possessor of the whole truth of a thing, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to meet objective needs that may fall outside of that purview. These disconnections of various insights, as the Pope observes, quote, makes it hard to find more adequate ways of solving the more complex problems in today's world, close quote. The good news is that the discipline of economics itself can enable us to confront this knowledge problem. This was, to a very great extent, elaborated by the Nobel laureate Friedrich Hayek. He observed that the knowledge required for economic planning is not resident in any one source, but is dispersed throughout the whole of society, and that central planning, which proceeds on the synoptic delusion, is in fact a fatal conceit, as he called it. It is true that for the needs of those who are impoverished and lack resources, knowledge will be required and some kind of concentrated social effort enacted for their behalf. That is true. But this process of discovery as to what the actual needs are and what the real resources are available to meet those needs, as well as the relative trade-offs that will be required to transform those resources into goods required, this knowledge is dispersed. The only way it can be obtained is through the free signals that we call prices, sent across the whole of the economy by producers, consumers, buyers, and sellers. This is what is known as a market economy, which must be free in order to reliably communicate this accurate information across all sectors of society. The problem of this epistemic problem for human betterment may admittedly be seen in somewhat different ways. Moreover, this does not mean that market growth by itself can guarantee integral human development. Integral human development is much broader. However, one must also point out that the hunger and poverty Pope Francis confronts in the encyclical requires economic growth, and that means market economics. We know both from scripture and the church's magisterium that man is given the primacy in the created order. This fact, however, also brings with it three important implications with regard to the environment. First, Man is to use the resources of Earth responsibly as, as that they serve the common good. Second, 
goodness and evil are not embedded in the material world itself, but are brought to the material world by the choices we make about whether or not we follow the moral law. And finally, the sanctity of life must be the primary concern of human political and economic organization. This is why Pope Francis and his immediate predecessors are quick to condemn any form of environmentalism which disregards or instrumentalizes human life. Now here, I must parenthetically note that this constant concern of the church for the dignity of human life from conception until natural death is somewhat compromised by the choice of a number of consultants to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences who might rightly be considered diametrically, energetically, and in institutionally opposed to this core element of the church's concern for the environment. Take, for example, Jeffrey Sachs. His commitment to what are euphemistically called reproductive rights is a matter of long record. Leaving aside the intrinsic evils that are invariably associated with the reproductive rights agenda, the demographic problem faced by most of the world today is depopulation, not to mention the imbalance caused by population control programs uh, in the number of females. Putting, however, that to one side, we must recall that respecting God's created order does not mean that it cannot or must not be used for the benefit of mankind. Human survival and thriving depends on exercising responsible dominion over creation by tilling and keeping the garden, as we read in Genesis. This occurs, one, by establishing regimes of property, and two, by using material goods in ways that better the human condition, always with an eye toward the finality of human destiny. Indeed, in Vatican II's Gaudi, Gaudi Metzpes, we see the recognition of this fact. So what is this to do with the market? The free economy, I suggest, is better suited to attaining the material goals outlined in Laudato Si than many of the means suggested by some commentators, and if I may respectfully suggest, even better means than some of the policy suggestions contained in the encyclical itself. After all, when Francis calls for care of the world that must be, as he says, dynamic and flexible, in number 144, we are obligated to ask if there is any institution in the world that is less dynamic and or less flexible than government bureaucracy. <laughs> Contrast this with, for instance, free exchange. This can be seen as a major social link that unites people throughout the world. Just as importantly and immediately related to the theological dimension, uh, just as important and immediately related is the theological dimension. God did not intend that human beings struggle on their own to survive. Rather, we are called upon to cooperate together to utilize the world's resources. This cooperation of free exchange, which must be rooted in both a moral and juridical framework, should not be artificially limited by the boundaries of city or nation state. Rather, it can and should be expanded to include all peoples of the world in their common project of advancing the material well-being of all and the common good. The opposite of free trade is economic coercion in the form, for example, of protectionism and sanctions. Numerous citations of the Holy See, and especially in the writings of St. John Paul II in particular, can be referenced to indicate a preference for free exchange at the national and international level. This might be called a form of economic solidarity, if I may, which promotes development, conservation, and technological advance. Environmental issues invariably raise the subject of technology. Here, the compendium of the social doctrine of the church reminds us that, quote, the magisterium's considerations regarding science and technology in general can also be applied to the environment and agriculture. 
In fact, this quote goes, technology could be price, a priceless tool in solving many serious problems in the first place, those of hunger and disease. Through the production of more advanced and vigorous strains of plants and through the production of valuable medicines. Close quote. It's funny this should happen while I'm talking about technology. Getting loud out to see for each other. Let's see, what were we saying about technology? Go ahead. In La Dauphine, number 104, Pope Francis worries that great technological achievement... Sorry about that, keep going. <laughs> ...gives humanity tremendous power and dominance, power and dominance, and that nothing ensures it will be used wisely. Of course, this is true. The question, however, then arises. If nothing ensures that this power will be used wisely, does centralizing the control of its use into the hands of politics increase the likelihood of its wise use, or would it rather, or would rather dissipating the control of power by decentralizing it better affect this end? St. John Paul II, even while acknowledging the same concerns that Pope Francis will identify, namely that the at times, quote, man consumes the resources of the earth and his own life in an excessive and disordered way, close quote, nonetheless identifies that, quote, at the root of the senseless destruction of the natural environment lies an anthropological error, close quote, Centesimo Sanus number 37. He goes on to observe that, quote, man who discovers his capacity to transform and in a certain sense create the world through his own work forgets that this is always based on God's prior and original gift of the things that are, close quote. So this raises the su subject of the place now, the place now being assumed by environmental issues in religious thought. Though references to environmental issues have become common in religious services, environmentalism has come to mean more than getting rid of air pollution and cleaning up toxic waste dumps. For many people, it has become their religion itself, even the essence of a faith that can lend credence to any number of troubling political measures. And this is acknowledged in Caritas in Veritate, number 48. It is one thing to recognize caring for nature as part of God's command to honor that which God made. It is quite another to transfer the sentiment of worship from the creator to the creation. Unfortunately, some people would have us reorder our priorities and turn away from the master whose garden we tend and keep. To focus upon the garden Serving it as though it were our ultimate end would be to serve the gift instead of the giver. We need to till and care for creation, not worship it. But surely there are good and bad ways to till and keep. There are ways that are more pleasing to God, ways that have a regard for the essential telos, or end for which the material world was made. The land should not be permanently injured so it cannot produce for future generations. Resources should not be wasted, but used efficiently. The well-informed conscience can discern these differences between the wise use and wasteful use, provided there are protocols and institutions in place that assist us in making economically well-informed judgments. Some of these include clear property titles and open markets. Understanding these truths means returning the environmental debate to a focus on the well-being of the person and the institutions that promote economic development. Contrary to what most professional environmentalists argue, property rights are among the best way of taking care of the earth. 
To be sure, free economies have their share of environmental problems. Many of these problems, however, could be solved by a more consistent del delimitation and protection of the rights to property. Finally, I'd like to turn to some of the claims made about the modern economy and environmental issues uh, as considered by Laudato Si. In number 165 of Laudato Si, Pope Francis makes a rather sweeping historical claim that invites comment and analysis. Here's what he says, namely, quote, that the post-industrial period may be remembered as one of the most irresponsible in history, close quote, in part due to such fossil fuels as coal, oil, and gas. At the very least, it is worth looking at this period, this historical period, the post-industrial period, to get the broad picture of what occurred to the human family in order to see if, in fact, it was one of the most irresponsible in history, as the Pope says. Consider some of these empirical reference points. Between 1800 and 1950, the proportion of the world's population living in dire poverty halved. And from 1950 to 1980, it halved again. The American farmer in 2000 produced on average 12 times as much farm output per hour worked as a farmer did in 1950. The development of new technology was a primary factor in these improvements. Environmental impact will naturally be mixed. Increased energy use driven by increased productivity, such as tractors, did increase greenhouse gas emissions. But further technological advances, such as more fuel efficient engines or alternative power sources, mitigated those effects. In general, in weighing a number of envi environmental indicators, various measures of water quality and air quality, re research has shown, and now I'm uh, quoting a, uh, an article from the Quarterly Journal of Economics, quote, economic growth brings down an initial phase of deterioration followed by a subsequent phase of improvement. This tipping point is at, at about 8,000 per capita income. The U.S. crossed this threshold in the years, between the years 1920 and 1940. Most European nations did so between 1940 and 1960. China and India are not there yet, but on their way. In other words, the post-industrial economy results in an environmental improvement, at least on some measures. It is the job of historians to help us see beyond our own time and hope that we can learn lessons that extend out of our narrow experience and into counterfactual realities that are otherwise unobservable to us. In recent years, researchers have made enormous progress using advanced research and statistical techniques in deconstructing the past that we did not experience. They have constructed large-scale indices of human well-being that extend several millennia back in time, perform detailed statistical analysis of global rates of poverty and wealth relative to the degrees of economic freedom, and carefully chronicled vital statistics that illustrate the relationship between material wealth and economic freedom. What all this research has revealed is that the world before 1800 was an unimaginably poorer one than our own. The average world income per capita was static at about $500 per year, and that's adjusted for inflation. Projects like the Gapminder have done even more detailed analysis to re re reveal just how much the world has dramatically changed over just the last 200 years. Only 200 years ago, the average lifespan was 40 and the average income was about $1,000. In this time, human population has risen seven times, average income has gone up 10 times, and the average lifespan has nearly doubled. There is not a single 
country in the world today that is as poor as all countries in the world were prior to the 1800s, prior to 1800. These trends have completely changed our conception of what life on Earth is like. And it has changed our expectations about what is possible. It has allowed us to imagine and even take for granted the possibility of material progress and prosperity for masses of people. The great divergence that we see within all of these studies began at the Industrial Revolution and continued through the great age of liberalism in the 19th century. What made the difference is the subject of widespread debate among economists and historians. What it is what institutional change, political change, technological change, or cultural change is responsible for are all matters of great research and debate. There is not one easy answer, and the full truth probably rests with a balanced understanding of the relationship among all of these factors. History and statistics alone reveal nothing about cause and effect. Causal factors can only be discerned through good theory. But note that there is a common feature that people working in this area agree upon. Human well-being is inseparable from the technological innovation and from capital accumulation. I suggest that what occurred in the period following the Industrial Revolution is the very definition of what it means to be responsible. Further, this dramatic increase in human well-being takes place in a way that is clearly and obviously inequitable. The rich get richer to a greater and faster degree than the poor climb out of poverty. And yet, as you observe the long-run trends, what you see is remarkable. Rising wealth has benefited the entire world community. So imagine this, if there were some policy in place that could mandate that no progress can take place unless it takes place evenly across all countries and across all demographic groups. This equality in the pace of progress was seen to be a moral priority, even more important than long-run increases in human well-being in general. Imagine if this policy came to be implemented based on the view that it is better that no one group should become rich if all groups do not share equally in the blessings of that rising prosperity. Now under that rule, the outcome of history might have been very different. As a world community, we would be one-tenth as wealthy as we are today. And our lives would be a little more than as half as long as they are. These are moral considerations we must face when, we're, when we prioritize the equality of sharing over the freedom to own. There is an additional consideration that is relevant to population, which is now pegged at about 7 billion instead of the 1 billion of 200 years ago. We escaped the Malthusian trap through economic productivity, based on the emergent institutions of capital ownership, investment, and trade. If those institutions are harmed, how would the capacity of the world's economy to feed, clothe, and heal a population of 7 billion people be affected? Would the population ever have risen to the point that it has today? And I leave you with that question. Thank you very much. Do I feel the questions, or do I get a bodyguard? Okay. <laughs> it's that one now, yeah. so I don't have another one to hand you. If you want to just direct the questions and perhaps restate just the questions. Restate so the questions okay, when they ask that. it. That'll be fine then, yeah. So, any comments, questions? Wonderful talk. So, Mike. You were checking all my references there to make sure. <laughs> <that you're laughs> 
So my question is on what are your thoughts on something like the triple bottom line with the idea that there are economic ways to incentivize taking the environment into a business or free market estimation? That, that's called prices. Okay. <laughs> it's there. It's built into the system. You don't waste things. The thing that obscures that uh, authentic triple bottom line from being enacted are a host of regulations that obscure the information so that you don't know that something is really... I mean, taking out of the environmental or the direct environmental question, look at what happened under uh, communism in, in Eastern Europe in terms of the, um, the lines of people. That's a scarcity question. Lines of people to, to, to buy bread, to buy food, to... And, and the malproduction, so that you'd go in and there were tons of size 13 shoes available and none in size 9 and 10. Uh, because they had these great plans, but they didn't have the information from the consumer saying, no, there are more of us who need size 9 and 10 rather than 13. So they just produced these plans. So yeah, they, they produced all these shoes, and then the shoes went to waste or people stuff newspaper in them to, to make up for the, the thing. Um, so I'm saying, what I'm saying is that a, a really free economy, again, rooted in law, uh, you know, delineated with clear rights and low taxation, because like taxation is another way of distorting the inf information flow, can, can to a greater extent, do I say it will do it perfectly? No. But to a much greater ex extent, account for the needs of the environment than uh, central planners. First of all, thanks for your talk and for your questions. Um, one question that I have, um, with all this information that is very sound and very rooted in facts and different things, we face uh, a big challenge with a relativistic society, with people who go more with their feelings rather than facts, Did, did you all hear that question? Please repeat it in brief. Okay, so in brief, um, what do we do in the face of all of this, these facts, uh, with a society that's increasingly um, irrational, that's emotive, that uh, makes its choices based not on uh, reason, but on emotion? Um, of course, you, you've hit the fat nail on the head here, uh, because this is the, the problem not just of the environment, it's the problem of the meaning of human life, it is the problem uh, of materialism, it's the problem of uh, the corrosion of thought and the erosion of Western civilization. So your question is, what, what do we do about that? We do this about that. That is, the majority of the people in this room tonight are relatively young people. You're thinking people. You're gaining models, and I don't mean just by this talk, but the other talks that, that are here, uh, that are modeling to you how to think through a problem in a responsible way. I think our educational systems are uh, need, in need of reform, and so that we need to teach these great lines of thinking, uh, particularly the uh, avoiding the um, dichotomy between faith and reason, so that a, a lot of reaction on the part of believers, for instance, to um, scientific claims or argumentation is to retreat into some form of fideism or piety or uh, a form of emotionalism. Um, and I think that's wrong, and it's certainly not Christian. Uh, Christianity has always had the logos at the center, which is reason. Um, I won't go into that. There's a whole speech that <laughs> Benedict gave at Regensburg that, that gets to this, this question. That that would... On the other hand, we can't just descend into this kind of relativism, which looks like, uh, I'm sorry, not relativism, empiricism, which looks like reason. But it's not. It's merely empiricism. It is an accumulation of data points 
And data points themselves, which I said here basically in the environmental question, data points, data points don't tell us what ought to be done. They just tell us what is. And the longing of our heart is what are we to do in the face of all of this. Now, when we live in a society that laughs at religion at the same time that it, it is apoplectic about having safe zones in universities lest anybody say anything to defend you. You know, that you can't stand your ground and argue the question. You, you just have to be protected from that. Or where, um, uh, where you have people who seriously uh, act in a way that they can affirm and have others affirm their identity as dragons or mice, or cats, or men who think they're women, or women who think they're men, and it's all the piece. When you have a society that can, in the name of tolerance, allow that to become the norm and then impose that upon everyone else. Also, not just a, uh, a cultural problem, but we have a political problem. And we have a political problem. Uh, I'm just finishing a paper now on this question um, of religious liberty institutions tied again to the question of property rights because if we allow our institutions to be taken over then we you know allow our property to be confiscated and all the rest of it then we lose this great influence to be able to create for like this where we can we can teach and model the use of reason so um, we have to well to use the scripture offer a reason for the hope that is within us. Another very potent way of doing this, by the way, uh, especially, and I think it is really, and needs to be the core of the new evangelization, is the use of storytelling, the use of media, by which I just don't mean um, uh, broadcasting these things. F fine to do that. You know, and all 85 listeners or viewers are going to be terribly edified. I'm sure you have many more viewers than that. But to create a dramatic movie or a television series or to write a poem that moves the world, you know, these kinds of things. And this is what you should be thinking about. How can you contribute in this way so that we're not um, just defensive? about these questions, but that we're proactive and that we're proposing beautiful and winsome alternatives to the insanity that even that person who is in the process of becoming a dragon, so he or she or he and she thinks at this moment, uh, that even such a person would be attracted to the good, the, the true and the beautiful. I have a couple of uh, leftist-thinking friends, and a um, couple of leftist-thinking friends. Yes. You, did you, you didn't bring them with you tonight? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you have something in common with them, based uh -huh. on my reading of okay. Britain, and that is, both of you are very negative about uh, crony capitalism. Okay. So th let me just kind of say that, and then you can continue, just so that we. So uh, his leftist friends and I have something in common, and that is namely that we're uh, both against crony capitalism. Yes. Go ahead. Now, the, the thought that I have is that don't we really have to think in terms of somehow defeating crony capitalism, this very uh, bad alliance, if you will, arguably, between big government and big business before we can even really think, uh, hopefully, about establishing a free market system. Okay. So the question is, uh, don't we have to find a way to combat this alliance between big government and big business uh, before we can think, hopefully, about a, a new world, a, a, a free, free market. Well, first of all, let me say that I, 
have a lot else in common with your left-wing <laughs> friends. Uh, we have bodies. <laughs> uh, we are human beings. We breathe. We consume calories. There are a lot of things that uh, are in common. It, it's what we differ on. Because my alternative uh, is to decentralize power. And their alternative is to further concentrate power. So their answer to crony capitalism is state, state capitalism, or statism. And mine is freedom under law, under the rule of law. Uh, and your friends don't like capitalism, period, crony or otherwise. Uh, and, I, well, I don't know. I don't know who you're talking about. I'm sorry, I was just reading Engels. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of in that Marxist mode again. It's been 40 years since I've been there, but it comes back easily. It's like a bad habit. You, you know, have an urge to smoke again. Uh, kind of thing. Um, no, I think I think in order for us to come out of this this incredible um, polarization, the only alternative uh, is to think clearly. And with all due regard and, and honest respect for your friends, because I, I have a pro a, I probably have more left-wing friends than you do. Um, they may not think of me as a friend, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, they just need to, they need to think more clearly uh, and, and consistently about what, what they don't like about crony capitalism is that it creates privileged classes that can rule over other people and dominate the lives of other people. And that I call socialism. I think crony capitalism is a form of socialism. I think fascism is a form of socialism. Uh, and let me see, I mean, that's what Hitler called it, right? National socialism. And what we have, by the way, I don't mean to get too terribly but what we have on the political stage right now are two very clear forms of socialism uh, in the person of Bernie Sanders, uh, who is, I find him so refreshing. It's just finally a Democrat who admits he's a socialist. <laughs> and Donald Trump, uh, who, who is, as far as I can tell, if that poses, is this great form of of the appearance of private property without the control of it. His endorsement of Kilo, the, the eminent domain legislation that was passed, is, is a prime example of, of what I'm talking about. So you, you know, you have what's supposed to be a clash of ideas, but it's really not a clash of ideas at all. It's just a confluence uh, of ideas. And it alarms me to no end that it seems like a, a significant part of the electorate are enamored of these, these people. I shall leave Hillary and Cruz alone tonight. Because <laughs> I just wanted to illustrate that and I needed some cartoon-esque characters. <laughs>
St. John the 23rd was up there with the seminary and he was showing around. And St. St. John said to the seminary, this is the most beautiful view of Rome in all of the city. And remember, I'm infallible. <laughs> of course, he was joking. The Holy Father there is citing a consensus of scientists. I'm not a scientist. And by the way, neither is he. Um, he has some science background in high school. Some, some of the reports on this encyclical refer to him as a scientist, which is why he's interested in these questions. He did a science degree, an engineering degree, in high school, and maybe some junior college, too. So we just take it based on the truth of, of what the consensus is. And remember that the consensus of science is always in flux. That's the nature of science. A good, scientists, a good scientist will welcome your refutation of their theory because now they've cleared that out of the way. They don't have to spend any more time wasting time on something that's not true and move on. So whether or not that is true is a matter for scientists to debate and to discover. Uh, my, my point is that the solution to that, if that is the question, is not to slow down the technology, but to speed it up. And, and, and for that matter, uh, to also more clearly delineate property rights, because then we can tell uh, what's really being wasted and what's creating the threat. And why the threat is being created. Because, I mean, you know, you could, it could be very well true that, that the planet is, is warming. Um, but why? You know, is that a man-made effect? I know elsewhere in the encyclical he identifies himself with that. But I, I, I'm not sure. You have to ask yourself also what bodies of scientists and what incentives might they have to, um, to conform with that scientific consensus. It's a very hard thing to do, to stand and say something that's a little different from your own profession. So those are the questions I would ask. And, and I do it respectfully uh, and at the invitation of the public. What do I mean by free market? And how, to what extent that is like the economy in the U.S.? Um, the economy in the U.S. largely, at the period of the Industrial Revolution, and that whole period that I described as the great period of liberalism, <laughs> the liberal, and I'm, when I use that term liberalism, I'm using it in its historical meaning, not the Hillary Clinton meaning. But that we're, we're, we're economies were more generally free. Um, when I say free market, I'm, I'm talking um, largely about what St. John Paul II refers to in the encyclical Centesimus Annus, uh, number, I forgot the number, but where he says, when he takes an account of the collapse of communism in Central Europe, and he says, now, what should we recommend to these nations coming out from under the, uh, the wreck of real socialism? And for that matter, what should we recommend to the developing world? He says in this section of the encyclical. And um, he says that there are two alternatives. Uh, shall we recommend a free economy? He said, well, that depends on what you mean by free. And he says the one that he would recommend is an economy where free moral, free, free economic actors based on business, on the rights of property, on the rule of law, rooted in an, a strong juridical and ethical system. That's what he, how he describes. That's what he would recommend, and that's what I identify myself with. And I think there's a lot of ground within there, within that system of private property rights and uh, ethical and um, legal framework to have various kinds of approaches to the question. Uh, the United States government, to a very large extent from its founding up to about the progressive era, which would be the 1930s, even before that, uh, began turning. Uh, and now we see uh, an economy largely dominated 
by uh, businesses, banking institutions, who have effectively uh, purchased large, large sectors of the political class and prompt them to make legislation in favor of their businesses to hinder competition, to subsidize their endeavors, to protect them from international competition, um, and to protect them from one another, <laughs> by the way. So you get all of this kind of insanity going on where you have government subsidizing. It used to be the case that the government, on the one hand, would subsidize uh, tobacco farmers, and then, on the other hand, subsidize the television commercials that urge you not to smoke at the same time in the same place, in the same period of time. Now, I'm sure there are other absurdities exactly like that going on now. So I think we've moved away from that. I don't think that the United States is even the, the freest economy in the world anymore. I think there are other places that are much freer. There's a whole set of studies on this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Go ahead. So as an insignificant little consumer, like, how does this affect you? Or oh, great. Like you? you're, you're paying much more for things than uh, you would otherwise. Uh, the quality of your s goods and services while increasing over you know, years past uh, is it's hard for us to see uh, because we don't see what would be, you know, uh, what, what really could be in terms of, and I think when you have sectors of the economy that are not as dominated by these kinds of things, you do see incredible growth. Um, I think certain areas of uh, the um, uh, communications industry, you know, the internet, uh, is largely uncontrolled by the government, although they're getting their claws in there now. They're going to make people pay taxes uh, on things, you know, and, and then they want to get in and control various um, communications and things like that. So I think they could affect that as well. Judeo-Christian moral foundation, but I don't see that as a society norm these days. No, How you're right. do we have a free market economy when we don't have that foundation in moral morals? That right. The very good question. So the question is, uh, we don't have a free market society today because we don't have uh, these morals, and how can we have a responsible free economy without those morals? We can't. We can't. Uh, and, and, and nor should we choose one or the other. In other words, wouldn't it be nice if we could live in a, a nice uh, socialist society that was Christian? You know, the Acts of the Apostles is the imagination that people have. Which, of course, wasn't socialist at all, because it wasn't coercive. There was no legislation. It was inspiration. It was brotherhood. It was bonding. It was family. On the other hand, uh, you have some uh, extreme libertarians who, who see the solution to everything as technological and uh, market-driven, price-driven, so that, that there's a price for everything, that nothing exceeds the market price of a thing. And I think what they're doing is confusing subjective value in an economic sense, with objective virtues or norms in, in a more uh, anthropological, moral sense. So I think we must have these two things together. And I think that's part of the, the difficulty of it, is we have to communicate these things simultaneously. Um, yes? So the question is, what about the population bomb? Right? It was called the population bomb. Well, we're following that. Right. Well. Yes. And uh, Jeffrey Sachs is one of the great proponents. I call this humanophobia. Uh, I think he is a humanophobe, and this idea uh, is fear of human beings. Why do people fear human beings? They 
see human beings, more human beings are more mouths that are going to eat the pie. And so what we have to do is keep mouths at bay. So that is lower the population on the one hand, the entrance, and then speed up the exit on the other hand. Because then there are less consumers in the world. Now what's wrong with this idea? You know, it's somewhat plausible. I mean, uh, Malthus, well, no, it's not even, it not really is not moral and it's not plausible. It's anti-human. And here's why it doesn't make sense. Because only a materialist thinks that the human person is a mouth that consumes. The believer sees that it's also a mind that produces. It's a mind that creates. And that the economy is not static, so even from an economic point of view, it's false. And I think, by the way, more and more economists are, are really coming to this conclusion, that, um, that the economy is not static. That it's not a matter of if there are more people, there's going to be less uh, uh, percentage of the pie for everybody else. But that those more people are going to produce the pie, and they're going to grow the pie. And that's what happens. So it is a fallacy for people to associate, for instance, density with poverty. There are some of the least densely populated places in the world that are the poorest. And there are a number of these places on the plains of Africa. And then there are some of the most densely populated places in the world that are enormously rich. I give you New York, I give you Hong Kong, I give you Tokyo. So, the density question, that is the number of people with the relative uh, uh, per capita income, is, is a false uh, uh, connection. I, I'm trying to choose different people. So. Well, no, so uh, let me just repeat this. I'm alluding to the, the trial of Galileo and, and whether or not the Earth rotates around the Sun or the Sun rotates around the Earth, which, by the way, there are some rather scary people who are trying to resurrect that theory. Um, <laughs> and so it's not always the scientist. Of course it's not always the scientist. And the model, to my mind, is precisely the priest's science. You, you, you know who formulated the scientific um, uh, the Big Bang? Well, the, the Big Bang. No, I'm the, the, the scientific um, theory. The scientific theory is a priest. And then the Big Bang theory is a priest. And Capernaum. And, and we can go on that, that, that it is precisely this joining of and let, let me explain why this is the case too. It's, it's important that you just get this point. If it is all material, if it is all just physical, this lessens the sense of wonder. If there is no purpose in the universe, it lessens the impulse of curiosity and understanding, comprehensive understanding. I mean, imagine two people approaching the world, one who doesn't believe it has any purpose or order or design, and another per person who, who begins by believing there is order in the universe, there's a purpose, there's a design. That person is going to have a greater propensity to ask the bigger questions and see the bigger context than the person who just, just doesn't. And that's why it's important that fetus and ratio are held together. And I don't know what my I have just bumped up against it. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention.